Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left off with the Battle of Chickamauga, cavalry under Colonel Minty and the Mounted Brigade of Colonel Wilder delayed the Confederate advance across West Chickamauga Creek for the better part of a day. Now we move into September 19th with many Confederate troops on the west side of the creek and Union forces attempting to ascertain their whereabouts. Although the Confederate advance had been delayed, Rosecrans' Army of the Cumberland could still be cut off from Chattanooga. With that scary thought in his mind, Rosecrans turned his most trusted commander, Major General George Thomas, to extend Crittenden's left to the north and secure the Lafayette Road, which was their connection with Chattanooga. By dawn, Thomas had brought the divisions of Brigadier Generals Absalom Baird and John M. Brannan to the Kelly House and Farmstead. They had marched most of the night and when they arrived, began to cook breakfast. The night before, Colonel Daniel McCook arrived near Reed's Bridge to help in the defense of that sector, but arrived once the majority of the fighting was over. He did take some prisoners, but was ordered by his commander, Gordon Granger, to fall back to Rossville. Before he left, some of his Ohioans tried to burn Reed's Bridge, but Confederates in the area put it out before any damage was done. Since most of McCook's prisoners were from one brigade, he surmised that a lone southern brigade was trapped on the west side of the creek. He informed Thomas of that when he pulled back to Rossville. Thomas wasted no time and moved Brannon's men forward, who were still in the process of cooking their breakfast. The only rebels in the immediate area was a brigade of cavalry ultimately under Forrest, but commanded by Brigadier General Henry Davidson, who had been sent to that sector when it was discovered that McCook's men were attempting to burn the bridge. The brigades of Colonels John T. Croxton and Ferdinand Vanderveer approached Jay's Mill along two roads attempting to find the lone Confederate brigade described by McCook. Croxton ran into the 10th Confederate Cavalry and Vanderveer hit the 1st Georgia Cavalry. Forrest realized he couldn't hold back two Federal brigades with the men he had, so he instructed his men to hold as long as possible until infantry support could be brought up. The Wizard of the Saddle sent notes to Bragg, General Walker, and Walker's brigade commanders, and all obliged to send help. The brigades of Colonel Claudius Wilson and Brigadier General Matthew Ector marched north to help Forrest throw back the Union brigades. Wilson formed on Forrest's left, with Ector instructed to keep marching north to tackle Union forces coming down the Reeds Bridge Road. Wilson pushed towards Croxton's line, who was surprised with such a large force meeting him and saw that his right could be outflanked so he began to move the 10th Kentucky in that direction. But while the 10th was moving behind the 74th Indiana, the Hoosiers confused the Kentuckians' orders with their own and thought they were to perform a general retreat and fled about 200 yards to the rear. Croxton worked to reorganize the 74th, and while he did that, the 10th Kentucky performed a brave charge to send back Wilson's brigade, which provided Croxton with enough time to get the 74th back in line with the rest of the brigade. Croxton had been falling back gradually as the Confederate brigades came closer and closer, hoping that Vanderveer would come up on his left so that his line would be more secure. But Ector's movements would prevent that juncture. The skirmishers in front of Brannan had done a spectacular job of stopping the Union advance, and now that Ector was ready to attack, the situation seemed dire for the Union. The Rebel Brigade rushed forward, but the artillery from Battery I of the 4th U.S. Battery positioned in between Vanderveer's regiments, along with an incredible volley of musketry, forced Ector back. It was a significant blow to the rebels. Meanwhile, Brannan realized his brigades were heavily engaged and sought to reinforce them at once. He took his last brigade, that under Colonel John Connell, and divided it. He sent the 31st Ohio to help Croxton, while he personally led the rest of the brigade and the 4th Michigan Battery to Vanderveer's aid. Ector made another attack, but it was just as costly as the first. Every mounted officer lost a horse. Two regimental commanders went down along with a number of flag bearers. Colonel William H. Young of the 9th Texas received a bullet to his chest, his second of five wounds he would receive during the entire war. The attacks, although unsuccessful for the Confederates, moved Vanderveer's line to where it faced more south than east. It was 10 a.m. and Brannan had thrown in all of his brigades, so he sent word to General Thomas for additional reinforcements. Thomas called up for Baird to come to Brannan's assistance. Meanwhile, Ector grew concerned about more Union regiments in his front, and particularly his right flank. He told Forrest about his concern for that area, and Forrest replied, Tell General Ector that he need not bother about his right flank. I'll take care of it. 
To the south, one of Bear's brigades under Colonel Benjamin Scribner charged into Wilson's left flank, shattering it completely. Wilson ran over to that flank and tried to rally what was left, but to no avail. His right crumbled after that. Scribner's brigade got broken up by the successful charge and its commander had trouble putting them back together. Ector kept up the pressure against Connell and Vanderveer, but he was not expecting what happened next. Ector told Forrest about his exposed left flank and Forrest sent word back, tell General Ector that by God I am here and I will take care of his left flank as well as his right. Unfortunately for Forrest and Ector, the cavalry commander did not have enough troops to do that. Brigadier General John H. King's brigade slammed into Ector's flank and sent the Confederates running. Many of Ector's men were captured by King's men. Thomas's division had thrown back two brigades of Confederates and his brigades reorganized themselves after the successful attacks. At that point, a short lull came over the battlefield. It was 11 a.m. and both sides had begun to reinforce their lines, preparing for what may come. George Thomas asked Rosecrans for more reinforcements, which Rosecrans happily gave. Brigadier General Richard W. Johnson's division and Major General John M. Palmer's division moved north to support Thomas's expanding line. Bragg was now heavily concerned about his own battle line, as his plan to push the Union Army south away from Chattanooga had been unsuccessful. The rest of William Walker's corps swung north to engage Thomas's successful troops. Bragg's left was secure under Generals Hood, Buckner, and Cheatham, so he detached Cheatham's division of Polk's corps and sent it north to add to Walker's left. Scribner and the other Federal brigades under Thomas were busy celebrating their recent victory when Walthall and Govan's men attacked. They were told that there would be reinforcements coming from the southwest, so not to fire on them, but this was the enemy. Battery A of the 1st Michigan Artillery held on with the help of the 10th Wisconsin for a short time. The commander of the artillery, Lieutenant George Van Pelt, died defending the guns against the advancing rebels, but eventually all the Federals were forced to pull back. Starkweather didn't have time to change the front of his brigade before the gray lines wrapped around his flanks. The brigade made up of men from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Pennsylvania held out for a short time, but they too fell back in disorder. Now there were no federal units between Govan and Walthall's men and the flank and rear of King's regulars. Baird arrived in time to tell King to orient part of his brigade to the south, but it was too late. He had only managed to get his battle line to partially face in that direction before the Confederates swarmed over the landscape, capturing a great many of the blue-clad troops. King alone lost around 500 as prisoners, over one-third of the fighting force he brought into the engagement. In less than 30 minutes, the two Confederate brigades had devastated the Union's left flank, but the disorganization from their success and the casualties accumulated from the attacks was wearing on them. Walthall's men continued forward and attacked Connell's depleted brigade. However, the 9th Ohio, made up mostly of German immigrants in Cincinnati, had been left behind to guard the wagons, but Connell brought them to the front to reinforce the rest of his brigade. When the Mississippians came forward, without orders, the Germans charged forward with a yell, stunning the exhausted rebels. The attack was so unexpected and even a surprise to Connell that they drove the Mississippians away. To the east, Croxton's brigade, fresh from the rear, where they filled their cartridge boxes and rested, had marched south upon hearing the sound of battle and seeing that their comrades were retreating in disorder. Once he was in position, Croxton ordered a bayonet charge that drove Govan's men away. A private in Croxton's brigade recalled later that Croxton ordered a bayonet charge, which was performed in a style never surpassed and scarcely ever equaled, driving them in the wildest confusion, actually running clear through their lines and capturing many prisoners. Scribner, King, Vanderveer, and Connell guarded the Reeds Bridge Road, and Nathan Bedford Forrest was going to attempt to outflank the Union along that road. As he moved Dibrell's brigade to the northwest, so moved Vanderveer and Connell to meet the threat. When the rebel cavalry attacked, the infantry line studded with artillery convinced the attackers to fall back in great haste and signaled to Forrest that the line was too strong at the moment to turn it. The fighting in this sector died down around noon. Walker's reserve corps had been bloodied significantly and the divisions of Baird and Brannan had eventually repulsed the attackers, but at a great cost. Most of the Union divisions pulled back, leaving only Croxton out front after chasing Govan's men back toward West Chickamauga Creek. This lull, like the other, would be short as Cheatham's fresh division moved out. 